Hello Anatomy, welcome to part one in what will likely be a two-part video series for chapter six, the muscular system. In this video, we're gonna go through the three types of muscle tissues, how they're different. We're gonna go through the anatomy of a muscle cell, how muscles work. Um, we're gonna save the, the labeling of specific muscles to part two of this, of this video series. Okay, so let's jump right in. So the muscular system, when we did the, the chapter on tissues back in chapter three, I believe we've already briefly gone through the three types of muscle tissue. They are skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. A little bit more on each of them in just a minute. Some characteristics of muscles. So when we talk about muscle cells, muscle cells are basically long, long fiber-like cells. So when we talk about muscle fibers, a muscle fiber is a single muscle cell. And again, they're, they're short and narrow. They come, usually they come tapered on the end oftentimes. So it's the contraction and shortening of muscle fibers, muscle cells that leads to movement. And inside muscle cells, you have these things called microfilaments, which are basically sort of like long uh, protein fibers that can contract. And when they contract, the muscles shorten. And if, you know, the, if that muscle is attached to two different bones, it would pull the bones together. Anytime you see the prefix myo or, or mice, that's talking about muscle in either Greek or Latin. Uh, the prefix sarco means flesh, which oftentimes when you see sarco, you're also talking about things having to do with your muscles. So anything myo or mice or sarco refers to your muscles. So we're going to go through this more on a later slide, but basically here we have pictured um, a muscle. If you took the muscle apart, you can see there are these, these long muscle fibers that have this white connective tissue covering around them. Um, what you're seeing here, again, are, are muscle fibers, the, the endomycium, and again, we'll see this on a, a later slide, surrounds muscle fibers, sort of the fibers are embedded in the endomycium. A, a bundle of these fibers is surrounded by a connective tissue layer called the perimycium, and then the epi, epimycium surrounds the entire muscle. So largely, the pattern here is you see these muscle cells, these muscle fibers, surrounded by different connective tissue layers, and we sort of pack them together. You know, individual muscle cells are, are, are pretty fragile, they're not very strong, but muscles can contract to, you know, in, in, to create an incredible force. Why don't the muscles just, you know, tear apart, why don't they shred? Because they come in bundles, and there's strength in a bundle, and the connective tissue layers bundle the muscle fibers together. So, you know, individually, not that strong, collectively, very strong. Okay, so we did this back in chapter three, comparing the three types of muscles, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So skeletal, um, let's just go through each one and go through the, the three descriptors. They attach to bones, sometimes your skin, they, they move your bones. In case of your face, they might allow you to make facial expressions. Skeletal muscles are, they're, um, they're very long, they're multinucleate, which means they have multi, multiple nuclei, and they have very obvious stripes. Um, and again, the connective tissue components we discussed, endomycium, perimycium, and epimycium, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Cardiac muscles found in the walls of your heart. Um, these also have stripes, the striations, like skeletal muscles. They also have these things called intercalated discs. We discussed this in chapter three. Those are connections between the muscle cells. It's very important for the muscles like cells of your heart to be able to communicate very rapidly. So oftentimes the, the cytoplasms of, of cardiac muscle cells is connected through these intercalated discs and they, they branch more than skeletal muscles do. They only have endomycium. Smooth muscles are found in, in visceral organs, like maybe surrounding your stomach. They are um, fusiform, like if you picture the body of an airplane where there, it's like a cylindrical thing that tapers on the end, that's what fusiform means. They have a, a single nucleus, they have no stripes, and they only have endomycium. Only skeletal muscle has all three types of connective tissues um, for, for support. So again, comparing them, skeletal muscles are voluntary, meaning you, you can control them. Now, you know, you can get things like twitches, which are involuntary, but because you can consciously control skeletal muscles, they're voluntary. The speed can be slow or fast. Rhythmic, not, not particularly. Cardiac muscle is involuntary. You don't have to think about your heart for it to beat. The contractions are slow. You know, they're, they're very steady, but they're not, they're not quick like skeletal muscles, and they're very rhythmic. Smooth muscle are involuntary. You don't have to, you know, when you swallow food, swallowing is voluntary, but getting the food down your esophagus into your stomach, into your intestines is involuntary. 
the speed's pretty slow. And rhythmic, oftentimes, yes, not always, but think about you know the, the, the peristalsis that gets food down your esophagus, that can be pretty rhythmic. Okay, going through each one quickly. So skeletal, most are attached to bones or tendons. Uh, Multinucleate, they have multi, more than one nucleus often. They're striated, they have the stripes, and they're voluntary, which means you can control them consciously. We kind of went through all this on the previous slide. So again, so here we're gonna get to those three connective tissue types. So, you know, the cells of skeletal muscles are surrounded by connective tissue layers. From the inside out, it's endomycium, then perimycium, and then epimycin. Mycium, excuse me, epimycium. So, in, you know, the root endo means inside, and again, mice refers to muscles. So, endomycium is this connective tissue layer um, that's surrounding um, a single muscle fiber. A group of fibers is surrounded by perimycium, which in the picture is this uh, tissue right here. Um, epimycium surrounds the entire muscle, and on the top or on the surface of the epimycium, this word fascia. So fascia is sort of the, the outside membrane around a muscle, which is on the outside of the epimycium. All of these are connective tissue uh, membranes. They add support and strength to the muscle tissues, the muscle cells, so they don't, they don't rip when you contract them. Think about like how hard it is to break a single twig versus breaking a bundle of twigs. Again, this is the same, the same picture, just bigger. You add the, the endomycium between fibers, the perimycium around bundles, the epimycium around the entire muscle, and then the fascia around the epimycium. And oftentimes, the, these connective tissue layers will sort of collect They'll gather at the bottom of the muscle, at the end of the muscle, and what forms a tendon. Remember, tendons are also um, connective tissue, and that attaches to a bone. Okay, actually, I just I just said what's on this slide. So tendons again are the cord-like structures that are that connect muscles to bones. Oftentimes, so again, muscles are are pretty fragile. If you have a muscle like go across a joint, when you move the joint, you're you're likely to tear the muscle. So oftentimes muscles don't cross joints, tendons cross joints. Tendons can't move on their own. They, you know, they, they're the attachment sites for muscles to bones. But having the tendon actually attached to or to cross the joint um, keeps the muscles from being torn when you, when you contract them. This word aponeurosis, so Basically, again, tendons are just a collection of, of connective tissue at the end of a muscle. And aponeurosis is also connective tissue. So I pick this picture. You see here and right here, especially down your spine, you have these, these thin fan-like layers of connective tissue that are connecting the muscles of your back to, to, the, to your spine. This is called an aponeurosis or aponeuroses. They're like tendons, but instead of collecting in one like point, they sort of fan like spread out and they connect in multiple points, in this case, along your backbone. So that, you know, they're attaching the muscle to the bone, just like a tendon, but they don't collect in one spot, they sort of fan out. So picture here, like if you are, if you are flexing your back, these muscles would be pulling, you know, maybe your arms toward your, your, your vertebral column and the aponeurosis is what's connecting the muscles to your, your backbone. Having one tendon wouldn't make really sense. Having it spread out in this flat fan-like structure makes more sense. So tendons and aponeuroses are, they're sort of variations on, on a theme connecting muscles to bones. So again, we, we, we just said the sites of muscle attachment, they can, muscles can attach directly to bones, they can connect to cartilages, or they can connect to connective tissue coverings like um, tendons or aponeurosis aponeuroses, I should say. So smooth muscle, let's go through this quickly. They don't have striations, they don't have stripes, hence the term smooth. They're still spindle shaped, they come to a point on the end. Single nucleus, they're involuntary, you don't have to control them, and they're found mainly in the walls of hollow organs like your stomach. Um, this picture, we saw a picture like this back in chapter three. So this is showing like a cross section of maybe your stomach or your intestines. And notice I have, I have two layers of smooth muscle. This layer, the cells are, are longitudinally arranged. So if this layer contracted, it would sort of make the, the surface area of the mucosa like do this number. 
right? On the outside, you have longitudinal ones. Here you're seeing a cross section. So here, like the muscle fibers are at right angles to one another. So here, if these contracted, the whole thing would be getting shorter. Again, picture this as being your intestines. So, you know, lining your intestines like this, you can contract them sort of circularly and longitudinally, which collectively moves food down your intestines or through your stomach. Cardiac muscles, they have striations. Like we said, they have stripes, usually have a single nucleus. They branch far more than skeletal muscles do. We discussed intercalated discs, right? There are ways that, that you can get signals from cell to cell. Involuntary, you only find these in the walls of your heart. Oftentimes, they are, these are arranged in sort of like these, these figure eight structures. Again, your heart beats. So picture these muscles contracting. They're going to contract and beat, which is what your heart does. Okay, so some functions of skeletal muscles. So one's obviously movement, like, you know, moving your bones. That's what you think of muscles doing. Maintaining posture. So think about, like, right now you're probably sitting in a chair. You know, you're sitting upright. The muscles of your abdomen or of your back, like, you're not moving necessarily, but those muscles are somewhat contracted to maintain your posture. So those would be muscles to help just maintain your form the way it is, which isn't necessarily moving, it's just stabilizing. This third point, stabilizing joints, this is often forgotten. So let me give you an example. So the muscles of your fingers, like to flex my fingers, those muscles cross your finger joints and they cross your wrist. Like they have like a muscle attaching here might also attach down here, you know, and doing this number is flexing the muscles completely. But I can make a fist, I can flex my fingers without moving my wrist because you have muscles in your wrist that stabilize that joint. And you know, your joints, we discussed in chapter five, joints are great because they give you lots of flexibility, lots of range of motion, but they're also, you know, they arguably could be designed better because it's easy to mess up joints, just ask soccer players who've torn their ACL a million times. Um, there's lots of muscles in a joint that might not necessarily move the joint, but they stabilize the joint. So when other things are moving, the whole thing doesn't just, you know, collapse in on itself. Generating heat, um, obviously, you know, your, your 98.6 degree average, whatever it is, body heat, your muscles give off lots of heat, which is, you know, you think of it as being wasted, but it, it generates your body heat, all right? Okay, so, okay, this gets a little deep, so just, just stick with me, kids. So here we're looking at um, a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. So sarcolemma is a fancy word. So you know all cells have a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. The cell membrane for muscle cells has a fancy name called the sarcolemma. Myofibril, so inside, so th this is one muscle cell. You see it has, in this case, three nuclei. You have these specialized long organelles inside muscle cells called myofibrils. This is where muscles get the striped, at least skeletal or cardiac, get the striped appearance from. Um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, so cells have, you know, in ninth grade bio, you learned about ER endoplasmic reticulum, which is a way to, um, of storing or moving things throughout a cell. Muscle cells have a specialized kind of ER called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's mainly gonna be for storing calcium ions, which we're gonna see in just a little bit. Okay, so let's zoom in on a myofibril. So these long things here. So if you look at a, the anatomy of, of a muscle cell, this gets pretty complicated. Just bear with me here. So you see there's, there's this region here that's this sort of light orange or peach color. And there's this region here that's sort of a darker red. So this is called an I-band. Um, the I-bands are light in light, the second letter is I. Then you have alternating dark bands. Um, they're called A bands, and the second letter of dark is A. So you have repeating a light band, or an I band, and an A band, an I band, and an A band, and they, they repeat, all right? Um, you have these things called Z discs. So there's a Z disc in the middle of an I band. Then you have this thing called an H zone. There's an H zone in the middle of a dark band. In between, like this H zone to this H zone, this little like rectangular part that I'm highlighting, that's called a sarcomere. And basically what a muscle cell is, it's, it's just repeating sarcomeres like you know cars of a train. Here's a sarcomere, here's a sarcomere, there'd be one here, there could be hundreds or thousands of them. 
And basically what's gonna happen is the sarcomere, see how these fibers overlap? You have these dark red ones and then these kind of blue ones. The fibers can slide past one another. When they slide past one another, the muscle fiber contracts and that, that's what muscles do, they, they contract, okay? So we have repeating um, I band and A band. The middle of an I band is a Z disc. The middle of an A band is the H zone. And again, these things repeat, all right? Okay, I just said this. The sarcomere is what you call the contractile unit of a muscle fiber. Going back a second, between H zones is a sarcomere. So there's two kinds of myofilaments. There's what are called thick filaments, which are made of myosin, which is a muscle protein. And there's things called thin filaments, which are made of actin. Going back to the picture, this, this sort of thicker red one, that's, that's a thick filament. This is myosin. And the little thin sort of blue ones, that's a thin filament. Those are made of actin. So the red things are myosin, the blue things are actin. At some point, like, this diagram and these terms, you, like you need to have this settled in your head pretty, pretty well to understand how muscles work. All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So the thick filaments, again, are called myosin. They're components of the protein myosin. They also have um, ATP ACE enzymes. The way for muscles to contract, you need to have ATP. Now the myosin filaments, let me skip ahead for a second. So this is, this is the same thing, just sort of zoomed in. So this is a myosin filament, the blue ones are actin. Notice how the middle of the myosin ones are pretty bare, but on the ends you have these heads. These are called myosin heads. So going back, the myosin filaments have heads, which are extensions or, or cross bridges. The thin filaments, the actin filaments do not have heads. And the myosin and the actin filaments somewhat overlap. Again, they're anchored to the, the two sides, which are called Z-discs. So let, let's look at this diagram for a second. So here I have a Z-disc here and a Z-disc here. This whole thing is called a sarcomere, and these things um, repeat. Notice how they partially overlap. So like here, I only have the, the myosin, which is um, where the M line is. Here they overlap, but notice on the ends, you know, the, the diagram shows them as having springs, and they're not literal springs, but they're, they're basically functioning like springs. What's gonna happen, I'm just gonna give it away, is this is showing a sarcomere that's relaxed. What's gonna happen is where the myosin heads are, think of them being kind of like suction cups and they're gonna stick to the, the actin. So imagine all of these sticking here and these sticking here. What would happen if they're stuck, if these heads all sort of copped inward and these heads copped inward, well, what happened is the, the thin filaments would all contract inward, okay? So when the muscle contracts, the M line basically disappears because it's the myosin fibers, the myosin heads pulling the actin filaments towards one another. So the sarcomere from Z-disc to Z-disc gets shorter. All right, let me say that again. The myosin heads attach to the actin fibers, so these attach and these attach. Think of suction cups. These heads are gonna pull this, um, this half of the, of the sarcomere to the left, these are gonna pull this half of the sarcomere to the right, and overall the Z-discs get closer together and the muscle cell contracts. Um, that's putting a whole lot into one little nutshell, but in a nutshell, that's, that's what happens. And imagine that there's 100 of these sarcomeres in sequence and they all do that, that causes the muscle cell to contract, okay? So this is what I just said. So at rest, you have this, this M-line, this, this was called the bear zone. Um, the H zone or the bear zone, that's what's here. The middle is called the M line. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, I mentioned this, this was the specialized form of endoplasmic reticulum that muscle cells have, that um, they, they surround the whole thing and they store and they release calcium. Calcium is gonna be important for muscle contractions a little bit later. This just shows it, it, it close up. When the muscle cell contracts, this bear zone disappears because the actin fibers come together. Okay, so the way you stimulate and contract um, a single skeletal muscle cell, so these four terms, excitability, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity. So basically, muscle cells can, can be excited. They can respond to a stimulus. Nerves are going to stimulate muscle cells. They can contract. They can, they can shorten. Um, they can also stretch. Elasticity, so 
when a muscle cell contracts, when the contraction is done, it relaxes, it goes back to the way it was. Notice in this picture, it shows kind of the spring things. When the myosin heads detach from the actin, the whole thing goes back to the way it was. Because muscle cells do have an elasticity to them that allows them to go back to the way they were before they were contracted. So they can contract and they can relax. So, okay, this is switching gears a little bit. So the way that a muscle cell contracts is that a nerve causes it to contract. The term motor unit, so this picture, this is showing your spinal cord. This is showing nerves from your spinal cord actually going to specific muscle fibers, all right? Muscle cells must be stimulated by a motor neuron, this motor neuron, this whole thing is called a motor unit for it to um, contract. If you've ever had an injury and they give you a TENS unit, little electrodes that stick to muscles, and when, when they shock you, your muscles contract. Um, you know, normally muscles contract because your nervous system stimulates them, your nerves. But you know, if you get shocked by something, you're gonna contract too. This is just the same picture bigger. Again, this is, this is a motor unit. You have nerves connected to specific muscle fibers. This is an actual microscope image. You see the muscle fibers going sort of longitudinally left to right. And here you see nerves, um, the long wire-like nerves. And you can see where they're actually um, attaching or making contact to different muscle fibers. They don't actually touch. We're, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So actually, we'll get to it now. So the neuromuscular junction. So this is showing, and we haven't done nerves yet. Nerves are in chapter seven, which we'll get to obviously in the next chapter. So I have, I have a nerve that makes contact with the muscle cell. They don't actually touch. The neuromuscular junction is like this region right here. The end of the nerve is called an axon. Um, the axon doesn't actually make contact to the muscle. There's a little space there called the neuromuscular junction, which we'll get to in a minute. Basically, when this nerve cell sends a signal to the muscle cell, the muscle cell contracts. So that gap between the muscle and the nerve is called the synaptic cleft. Again, the nerve and the muscle don't actually touch, and there's good reasons for them not to touch, which we'll see um, in a minute. It makes it easier to turn off the signal. The area between the muscle and the nerve is filled with fluid. It's just called interstitial fluid. An action potential is a fancy term for a, a nerve signal. When the nerve signal gets to the end of the nerve at the axon, what basically happens is it causes calcium channels to open and calcium to enter the axon terminal, and that's going to cause the muscle to contract on an, on an upcoming slide. So this is getting a, a little more detail than I might want to get into right now. So when, when the calcium ions enter that cleft, so there's things called neurotransmitters, things like acetylcholine, dopamine, um, adrenaline, ep epinephrine, these can all be neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, the way the signal gets from the nerve to the muscle cell is through a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And when that chemical, so you know, looking here, the axon secretes neurotransmitters, those go across the synaptic cleft and that's what binds to the muscle cell to turn on or to make the muscle cell contract. Without calcium, the signal can't get from the nerve to the muscle. Okay, so we did, we did that. We did this one, right? Yep. Acetylcholine is a common neurotransmitter. Okay, so wrapping this up. So acetylcholine attaches to re the receptors in the muscle cell. That, in response, causes the sarcolemma, that special plasma membrane of the muscle cell to become more permeable to sodium. Sodium channels open, and when sodium channels open, that's like the signal that's it's an all or nothing thing. Once the sodium gates open, the muscle contracts um, until the nerve signal is turned off. So this picture just shows all that we just said. I know we just went through a lot. So the nerve signal goes down the, the nerve, gets to the synaptic cleft. When the signal gets there, these little vesicles holding calcium fuse and calcium gets released into the synaptic cleft. Um, when the calcium binds to the muscle cell, that causes the sodium gates to open, which causes the muscle cell to contract. So calcium and sodium are both very important ions for nerve muscle interactions. This just shows the calcium um, causing the sodium channels to open. Eventually, the acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, it doesn't last forever. The body breaks it down. When it gets broken down, the sodium gates close. And when the sodium gates close, the muscle stops contracting. 
this picture just shows the point. Um, these are called all or nothing events. Once sodium starts the signal, the signal gets transferred down the muscle and the whole muscle contracts. This shows like, like setting a twig on fire. Um, you know, the flames start here, but they quickly spread down the twig and you can't turn it off. You can't, you know, throwing water on it won't make a difference. Once the muscle gets stimulated to contract, it contracts until the, the neurotransmitter like acetylcholine gets broken down and then the muscle stops contracting. So we, we kind of already talked about this next little section, the sliding filament theory. Remember how I said basically you have the thick filaments and the thin filaments and they overlap and they contract like that, they slide past one another. Um, when the muscle reacts, when the sodium channels open, basically what that causes, remember those myosin heads? It causes, so, so let, let's say here's a thin filament, here's a thick filament. It had a myosin head sticking up. The sodium channels opening causes the, my, the, the myosin head to actually bind to the actin. And that myosin head's gonna cock inward toward the middle of the sarcomere, which causes the filaments to slide past one another. It's called the sliding filament theory because the filaments, again, they slide past one another. The overall result is the muscle cell shortens or it contracts, um, which, will be, which will cause whatever bones it's attached to to come together, to flex that muscle. So we've seen these pictures. So here's a sarcomere that is, it's relaxed. You can see there's, there's this, this H zone or what's called the bear zone. Notice the myosin heads are not attached to the actin. Here, see, you can see here and here, the myosin heads are attached. And overall, the sarcomere has gotten shorter. The two Z discs, the one here and here, have been contracted or been pulled toward one another because the myosin heads have attached to the actin, the blue filaments, and then, you know, pulled them in closer to where the H zone was. So this picture, this picture is a little misleading. So in a muscle cell that's relaxed, so this picture, and we're almost done with this video, I promise. This picture shows, so here's the myosin, this is myosin, the peach colored stuff. Here's the myosin head. Here you have um, actin filaments. When the muscle is relaxed, there's, there's protein complexes, there's regulatory proteins that prevent the myosin heads from attaching to the actin fibers. They actually block it. This picture is a little misleading because it shows the heads attached to the blue. What this picture is meaning to show in the textbook, it shows this, but I'm not quite sure why this diagram isn't quite accurate. But picture this diagram where the heads can't make contact with the blue because the purple's in the way. Remember how we were discussing calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? When calcium ions are released, the calcium ions block the regulatory proteins. They sort of change their configuration and allow the myosin heads to attach to the blue. So th this is a better picture. So here, so like in here, you see here you have these little like half circle binding sites. That's what this picture is. The point is the myosin can't fit into the binding site. When calcium comes, it causes the purple regulatory proteins to change their configuration, which means myosin can bind into these little slots. Here it can't bind into a slot. The slots are being blocked by the purple. The calcium makes the slots be exposed. The myosin heads can bind into the slot. And then when the, the sodium channels open, that causes, it basically causes like this, this head to cop to the left, this head to cop to the right, sort of in that number, which causes the, the thin filaments to slide towards one another, which causes the sarcomere to get shorter. That's what this picture is. So see here they're not cocked, and see here they're, they're cocked inward. Um, when the free myosin heads cock or bend, it causes the thin filaments to slide toward one another, which makes the muscle contract. Okay, so we're going to stop there with the first video. So that was that was a lengthy video. Um, in class, we'll probably go into a little more detail in the the structure of the muscle of the muscle cell with the thin filaments, the thick filaments, and what what an action potential actually is. Um, but for now, I think that was plenty enough for one video. I hope that was helpful and I will see you guys next time.